I was, you know, I was so scared, right? I, I was so right. like, man, I, I just, I just jumped off the cliff. Now I got to build a parachute. All right, everyone, welcome to our next interview. I'm here with Riley Knox. He's out of the main area. Riley, thank you so much for being on the show today and joining us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, yes. So what I always like to start out with is obviously your background, your story. I'd love to hear a little bit the audit for the audience to know just a little bit of where you came from and what are you doing now? So the floor is yours and let's jump in. Yeah, where I came from, it's tough to pick a starting point, but I guess I'll just start with, uh, let's let's say high school, right? So after after high school or in, in high school, you're always trying to figure out like where your life is headed. Everyone wants to know, like since you're seven years old, what are you gonna be when you grow up? Um, and for me, um, met with guidance counseling in high school and um, I was a good student in math and science. So they sort of pushed me towards engineering seemed like a good fit. But my biggest kind of gripe with that whole process, and I'll just already make a comment, I guess, on kind of our education system, right? I think we have a tendency to push push people towards their strengths first, um, maybe without without asking what they're passionate about, right? So Mm -hmm. um, I was good at math. So I I went to engineering school, Um, uh, went to a maritime academy, studied marine systems engineering. Um, But I knew within within two months of my freshman year in college that this probably wasn't going to be the career path for me. Um, And I thought about leaving, actually. I thought about making a pivot right then and there. Uh, But I'd already accumulated $15,000 to $20,000 in debt. And I was just doing the math on how long it would take me to uh, pay off that debt, working, working minimum wage or working construction. Decided to stick it out. Um, and I've always really believed that, you know, in all things uh, that we find ourselves doing, we should, we should do our best. Um, so I did my best, did well in college, uh, graduated. Story is going to overlap on itself a little bit here. I uh, graduated and got a job with the Department of Defense as a nuclear test engineer, um, which sounds like um, a dream job. And it really was. It really was a dream job. Um, had I been a little bit more passionate about engineering. So I guess I'll, I'll pause the story there. I'll put a pin in it and go back. While I was in college, I um, met my wife, actually. Oh. Um, so we got married one week after graduation. <clears throat> so my wife and I are newlyweds. Uh, we're living in this town called Augusta, Maine, which is the state capital. And I am working in Kittery. You know, and at this point, I'm 22 years old. And for my whole life, I've been in school, um, in college, I was paying to go to school. This is for the first time in my life, I, you know, I've got a real job and I'm getting paid to do it. So that feels good to be on the other end of the paycheck. And I, uh, so my commute to work was um, 109 miles one way. Uh, I had to be there at 5 a.m. It was like a pretty typical nine to five desk job type work. Um, so I was waking up at quarter or three, leaving the house at three o'clock, driving, you know, 109 miles to get to work. Um, and we would go into these testing cycles. Occasionally I would work 40 to 50 days in a row of these eight or 10 or 12 hour shifts. Got to be pretty unhealthy with, with my wife and I, just, I wasn't seeing her very much at all. Um, spending most of my time on the road and at work. Uh, and because of the work I did for the Department of Defense, I didn't have my phone on me or access to any communication with my wife while I was at work. Um, so it left me feeling pretty, pretty empty inside. Like it was cool for a yeah. month or two where I was like, hey, I've got a real job. Um, but then I just quickly realized that um, engineering probably wasn't it for me. I, I thought back to my childhood and I thought like, I'm not a kid that liked to tinker. Uh, I just, I never really had that inclination. I happened to be good at math, but I was never really into trains and cars and trucks and that type of mechanical things. Yeah. So I was at that job for a year and a half and, and did well. Um, and then uh, in 2019, I guess I'll 
put another pin there and walk back just a little bit. 2017, uh, right before we got married, my wife purchased her first uh, multifamily rental property. Um, Which was a duplex? It was the triplex, three Ooh. unit. Um, and she didn't buy it as an investment. <clears throat> we, knew, we knew absolutely nothing about cash flow. Uh, we knew nothing about investment properties and we had no dreams of becoming a real estate investor. Um, my wife was simply trying to uh, move from a, a low rent situation with a family member uh, into her own home and without increasing her living expense. Um, and the only way we could really do that, I just had this thought one day, I was like, you know, what if you tried, you know, what if you bought like a duplex or something and that you had an, a tenant and they paid, you know, a portion of their mortgage, um, then you would be able to live more affordably. That was it. Like that was the extent of our investing knowledge. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. We had a great real estate agent at the time uh, who did know what he was doing and got us into a pretty good uh, three unit property. Um, so when I moved in with her, when we got married, the light bulbs started going off really quick. We're getting the mortgage payment in the mail. We're getting, um, you know, our electricity bill and the heat bill in the mail. And then these rents come in from the tenants and I'm doing the math and I'm like, babe, we're living here for free. Ah. And then it didn't take very long for me to have my next thought was, Hey, if we didn't live here we'd be making money. Um, so we actually, within short order, we lived in that house because we had bought it on an FHA loan. We lived in that house for 12 months and a day. And then we actually moved back in with that family member and rented out the unit wow. um, and started saving money for our next down payment. Took us 19 months, sorry, 18 months to save about $20,000. Uh, was this while have, you were doing the engineering job? Yes. This is my first year and a half as an engineer. Very um, good. Yeah. We, um, saving all, saving every penny we can, you know, paying off our debts, like traditional, let's say Dave Ramsey style finance, if you will. And at this point, I, I still really didn't have thoughts yet about what this could mean for my lifestyle. I hadn't really started that thought process yet, but eventually we had enough money saved and we bought our second investment property, which was a four unit that we also owner occupied. So this is, we closed on that deal in July of 2019. A couple months later, we found out that my wife was pregnant. Oh, um, yay. Really exciting, really exciting, right? Um, I'm on my way to work one day, uh, drowsing, driving drowsy, as I usually did, unfortunately, just due to the early morning hour. And I fell asleep at the wheel and had a pretty scary incident. Um, didn't crash, didn't get hurt, uh, but close enough was close enough to rattle me. Wow. This is the first time like I'm in this situation where it's kind of a close call and I have these fresh I'm going to be a father. I'm a husband and a father thought process going on. And I'm thinking, I don't want my daughter to, to see me do this. I don't want her to see me like spend 14, 15, 16 hours a day out of the house going to a job that it's pretty clear that I'm not passionate about. Yeah. Um, so I went to work that day, um, spent the next several days drafting um, an email to my wife, like a pretty long um, email to my wife explaining my plan, you know, that I, I wasn't passionate about my work. It was really important. I was just too young to be living a life that I wasn't passionate about. Wanted my daughter to see me do something I was passionate about. We had these two rental properties and we were just barely break even on my wife, who's a cardiac nurse. We could just barely within a few pennies afford to live off my wife's income and the income from the two rental properties. Mm -hmm. So um, send her this big email, explain all the reasons why I, I think I should leave my job and become a full-time real estate agent and investor. Um, and some of those reasons just consist of like, I want to be around my family. Um, I don't want to 
leave before my daughter wakes up and get home as she's going to sleep. Um, Let me interject what, real quick. Yeah. What were some of the emotions that you experienced as you were driving to work and from work every day at, up to this point? Like, how were you feeling? Because obviously this isn't just something, just the, the you know, close incident happened. It was, that was, it seemed like was the icing on the cake. So what was, what was brewing underneath of that? That's a great question. So there was actually a lot. Thanks for asking it. There was a lot that led up to that. Um, stress, mm. responsibility. I knew that the right thing to do was to be an adult and work a job and have a career. And I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, so that was, that was the main emotion I had at the time was mm. stress, a scarcity mindset, if you will. And that stress actually manifested itself. So I was 23 years old, former athlete, otherwise healthy. Um, and I was experiencing severe back pain, mm. um, severe. I, on my one and a half to two hour commute to work, I'd have to get out of the car two or three times on the side of the highway to walk around and stretch. Um, cause my back hurt so bad. Wow. Saw, saw my primary care physician, saw, um, chiropractors. And, um, they told me basically two things you know, one, you're spending way too much time sitting, yeah. you're spending four hours plus in a, a day in a car. And then you're spending, you know, seven to 10 hours in a chair. Um, and then the second thing that my chiropractor really talked to me about was stress, you know, and how that might be impacting me. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to circle back on that back pain issue. Okay. Further on in the story, but stress, stress to the point of physical pain, actually. Okay, so you're feeling stressed, you have the scary incident, you're writing this email to your wife saying, we can make it, here's what I think I can do, you have a child coming, you were basically living what everyone else told you you should do, and now you're here you are at this defining moment where you're like, this is what I think I should do. So, yeah, there? so I send the email to my wife, right, while I'm at work, I get home. And my wife is like, I was waiting for you to say that. I've been waiting for you to, to be ready for something different, you know? Wow. And that was completely not what I was anticipating, right? I was anticipating like, well, honey, what about our budget? What about this? What about that? And she was like, no, this is, you're going to kill it. You're going to crush it. I like, absolutely. Um, I don't know why we didn't do this a year ago. Um, that encouragement just, you know, meant so much to me. Um, Sounds like a great woman right there. She is. She's that's, I could do a whole podcast on how wonderful my wife is. Um, so I, I gave my notice like a couple of days after that. Just, just two weeks, really two weeks done. notice. Done. done. Go ahead. And Go I, ahead. I had never taken a real estate class. <laughs> um, we had those two rental properties, no cash. Um, and no other plan, <laughs> you know, um, gave my notice in early, late October of 2019. My last day at work was uh, September 13th, 2019. So Friday the 13th, actually. Um, nice. My wife. So it's my last week at work, Wednesday of my last day at work. So Wednesday, September 11th, my wife uh, was at home and miscarried the baby, um, which was, you know, like that's a whole nother podcast in itself, but a um, whole nother conversation, I should say. Um, obviously, we're devastated. Right. We're crushed. My wife is grieving the loss of a child. And here I am thinking to myself, one, I'm, I'm just, I'm devastated that I wasn't there, that I was at work in a government facility with no access to my phone. My wife's having the worst day of her life and she can't even call me. You know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I mean, I literally got out of work, called my wife and was like, Hey honey, how's your day going? And, you know, then I get the whole story and I had been absent, you know, for kind of this 
worst day of her life. I had been busy. Um, so mental note there, I don't want to let that happen ever again. Um, so my wife's grieving the loss of our baby. And I'm thinking to myself, we made a decision for me to leave my career based on kind of this assumption that we're going to, we're going to start a family. We're having a baby and this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Now we're not having a baby and I'm trying to muster up the courage to have a conversation with my wife about what she wants me to do because our plan is gone and there's no right time to ask her because she's just not even wanting to think about that. She's just devastated. Yeah. No. We end up, and I'm, I'm devastated too. We end up having a conversation about it. And she says, um, no, I, w- I want you to, I want you to leave your job. Um, you know, it feels right. It's what you're passionate about. I don't, you know, with or without a child, I, I don't want to see you, um, you know, spend your time doing work you're not passionate about. So that Friday, September 13th, I left my job. Now on my way to work that day, I had stopped three times on the side of the road to stretch um, because of the severe back pain. I kid you not, I left work that day and never experienced back pain again. Wow. Yeah, I mean, truly, whether that, you know, I think the stress has a part to do with that, you know, I believe in God and I believe that there were people praying for me and I believe I was healed. Perhaps um, there was an obedience aspect there to God's will for my life. Um, But I have never experienced back pain since the day I got in the car and left for the last time. Wow. So, Um, So if you're watching and you're doing something that is extremely unfulfilling and you're not happy with your situation, And if you're feeling any physical ailments, which can happen due to the stress, you may want to check in. It might not be anything but you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing, right? And you're totally unfulfilled. And that that can create different, you know, pain. So that's a that's amazing and and i also believe you know you know it's god's healing too right but yeah. you know this is a huge step to relieve the stress or the pressure uh on that so let me ask let's go to september 16th 2019 it's monday morning you wake mm. up and you don't have to get up at three o'clock in the morning what was that experience like for you how did you feel there well, I was up at three o'clock on the morning on September 16th. Um, so I got home from my job at about five o'clock on Friday night. And I immediately had dinner with my wife, started taking my real estate coursework. It was a 52 hour course. And I think I completed it in about 72 hours. So Monday wow. morning at 3 a.m., I was taking that course. Um, so that's what I was doing. I was, you know, I was so scared, right? I, I was so right. like, man, I, I just, I just jumped off the cliff. Now I got to build a parachute. And my wife had already, we had conversations about some runway, right? Yeah. We had, had a conversation about, you know, it takes time to build this business. So if I make $0 for 12 months, that was our plan. You know, if I make $0 for 12 months, she's cool with it. 12 months in a day. I'm submitting job applications. Um, so I, I kind of got right to work because I I, uh, I needed a paycheck, needed to find my next paycheck. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. So you became an agent? Yeah. And and so is that what you do now? Do you do investing? Where where does life bring you now? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so I'm, a, <clears throat> um, I'm an investor first and an agent second, both chronologically and in passion, I would say. So we started investing before I got my license um, and we'll we'll invest forever. Um, That first year, 2020, uh, we bought three more investment properties. Uh, 2021, we bought three more investment properties. My real estate sales business, um, the real estate agency business, um, got off to a really quick start actually 
way, way quicker than I anticipated, was able to replace that uh, Department of Defense income uh, that first year, which was, um, you know, blew, blew our goals out of the water. You know, I was really, really happy with that. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at today, still practicing real estate agency. Um, there's a, a whole <laughs> another component to our story that has, has um, led me to lifestyle design. If, if you want me to share some of that. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Um, so 2020 is the year that uh, COVID came out, right? Uh, there was the, fifth, the initial 15 days to slow the virus, right? In April, I think, of early March, 2020. Around that time, uh, my wife uh, identified a, a lump on her breast. Oh. And we went to the doctors, had it all checked out. All the tests come back non-cancerous benign tumor awesome july 2020 that non-cancerous benign tumor that was the size of a dime is now the roll, size of a roll of quarters um my wife is now pregnant again uh, which we're really thankful for and uh we go back to the doctors get tests again and my wife is diagnosed with breast cancer, um, specifically estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, which means that the nutrient for the cancer is estrogen. And my wife is pregnant with a girl. Uh. Um, so naturally, <clears throat> naturally, this, is, this, this creates a very complicated situation for our lives. Yes. And I had already had the thought process um, another thing about my wife, go back 10 years. Uh, my wife is 35 years old now. When she was 25, she went from being perfectly healthy. She had three grand mal seizures and an emergency brain surgery a week later, they removed a pretty significant chunk out of her, her left frontal lobe. Um, and her recovery from that process was lengthy. This was before I had met her. Um, but when we got married, we started thinking about what was important to us. One of the things that was important to me, one of my values is that if my wife ends up in a hospital bed for six months, I want to be in a position financially or otherwise, where I'm going to be able to be there with her. Cause obviously that's where my heart is. That's where my, that's where my value is. Um, so I always had this in the back of my head, like if my wife gets sick again, her, her specific type of brain cancer had a very high likelihood of recurrence. Mm -hmm. If my wife gets sick again, against all else, I want to be there. Right. Right. So here we are. My wife has breast cancer. We're traveling back and forth to Boston. We've got oncologists and tests and doctors, very, very complicated to treat breast cancer and pregnancy. Um, it's a pretty rare thing. Long story short, um, we ended up uh, finding a chemotherapy that would be compatible with the pregnancy, treating the cancer. Um, and then my wife um, delivered the baby at 28 weeks. Um, so in, in a very emergency, dramatic fashion um, at a hospital that doesn't typically del deliver preterm babies at all. Um, we, we deliver this baby on a Sunday afternoon in December, December 13th, 2020. And um, our lives changed in a moment, in a moment. We were having a perfectly mm -hmm. normal Sunday, uh, went to the doctor just to check on a little something we we're dealing with. And 20 minutes later, we've got, we've got a, you know, dramatic uh, surgery, my wife's all cut up and we've got a baby, um, that needs 24 hour medical surveillance. Um, mm. for Can the I foreseeable stop you real quick? Future. Yeah. Everyone listening, I want you to think about your life right now. And you might sit there and be like, well, I'm not where I want to be in life. You know, I, this isn't the life that I want to create, but maybe it's not that bad. 
And as you listen to his story, you know, could it be worse, right? Not saying that his story is bad. I'm just saying, like, look at all the challenges. You, we all have challenges, but if you take a look at your life now and where you're going, is it anything compared to what they went through and their story? So I just want you guys to just check that out and do kind of check in there because someone's always got it better and then someone's always got it worse. And can you be grateful for where you are now? That's a key. So sorry for cutting you off. No, so, no. I love it. I, I love that you're thing. giving value to the audience. So awesome. Um, you have the baby. and Yeah. So we have the baby, but this is during COVID. So we go to Maine Med where they have a neonatal ICU immediately. My baby gets on an ambulance. My wife gets on a different ambulance. And I drive down there with a buddy. Had to have somebody else drive me because I, I was too shaky to drive. And we spend uh, 67 days, for the most part, locked in a 10 by 10 room. Um, because it's COVID, right? So if we leave the hospital and get exposed to COVID-19, we're not seeing our baby for 14 days. So work, social life, everything stopped. Food rotted in our refrigerator. Um, you know, our, our cars, other people had to go find them and bring them home. Um, everything stopped. Uh, my business that was churning right along, um, you know, was left juggling and the the wonderful team I have at my office made that transition smooth, very smooth and seamless. My wife uh, now still needs to go to chemotherapy, right? Um, several times mm -hmm. a week, um, chemotherapy, right? At different appointments. And because of her condition with the treatment, she's not safe and stable to drive. She needs someone to drive her. My stepfather, um, quit his job and basically became Emily's designated driver for that period of our lives. They lived about 10 minutes away from the hospital. My mother was able to work from home full-time as well during that time period. And they made it there. So they, they quarantined with us. They said, listen, if you guys are not gonna be able to be exposed to anyone, you're gonna be exposed to us. So we're oh, quarantining. Wow, that's awesome. That's so cool. So for 67 days, we spent, 14, 16, 18 hours a day at the hospital, drove home, was fed a five course gourmet meal by my parents, sleep back to the hospital. You know, usually one of us would be at home sleeping, one of us would be sleeping at the hospital. Um, and so when you talk about lifestyle design, I was attempting to set up my lifestyle designed such that if my wife had an emergency, I was going to be able to be there for her because that was my value. Yeah. That didn't that didn't transpire. My, my wife had an emergency, but did not end up in a hospital bed for six months. But my baby ended up in a hospital bed for sixty seven days, and my wife and I were able to drop everything in our lives to be there for yeah. her in that time. So when people ask me about like for me, that's my the greatest accomplishment of my life is that when my daughter needed me nothing stood in the way. Mm, so when you think you about lifestyle, yeah, we did and not, not consciously. Mm. Um, you know, it's very hard to know what life will throw at you. When you think about lifestyle design and we just like everybody else, I mean, we think about travel, vacations, time freedom, um, nice things, uh, the ability to Kind of live our dream lives and that's one half of lifestyle design it really is is like hey what's my best case scenario life look like um and we ought to spend time thinking and dreaming and planning for that yeah you know but the other benefit of being financially free um financially independent if you will is that when stuff gets really 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 bad you don't have to make a compromise between your value and your reality. When we're in the hospital, it was a close friend of ours. Um, I shouldn't say a friend of ours, uh, friends that we made while we were there. Fathers who love <clears throat> their daughters, their children, 
just as much as I love mine. But the reality of their situation was if they didn't leave and go to work every day, you know, they were, they were going to be facing foreclosure when they got home, right? No, no, no. And I, you know, I, I love those men dearly and I pray for those guys too. And, and they weren't in quite as fortunate of a situation. Um, but I'm just, I'm so thankful that we, our life at that time was set up in such a way that we were able to live our values to their fullest extent. And so you guys, the reason why you had that was because you chose a vehicle like real estate investing. And there's many vehicles. You could build businesses, right? You could, there's a lot of things you could do, but you guys chose real estate. And that's what allowed you in those most difficult, darkest, challenging times to be able to be there every day, right? Yeah. And, and not have to be like some of those other parents and they're not, you know, they're not better or worse. It's just that they had to leave. It sounds like to go pre able to provide where you guys create life by design to be able to be there every day for your daughter in those 67 days. Yeah. And, and really they, they, they were great parents the di- and they had the same values that yeah. I have. The difference is the reality of their situation was just a little bit different. And one of the things they told us while we were there is for a baby, skin to skin contact is like the yeah. best thing possible for a preemie baby. Uh, so they said, as much time as you can physically hold her, that's the best thing for her. I yeah. mean, we, we would go in there and hold her for seven hours straight. Um, you know, and that's, so we actually had a role, a job to do during that yeah. time period. And it was hold her. Um, wow. And we treated that <clears throat> like it was our occupation. That's um, so cool. All and yeah, real time. estate was a great vehicle, a great vehicle. Happy to chat about that all day long. Yeah, let's, let's kind of move into that, like from your story now. So you have you you have a bunch of properties. You, obviously, you're in a position where your income has exceeded your expenses. And are you're still doing the age? You're still an agent, right? Secondary. Yes, I'm still an agent. Yeah. And so you're using that just for more investing money, I assume. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's a nice thing about a real estate agency business. Real estate agency, man, it can be a roller coaster. You know, especially when you're first getting started, it can be a roller coaster. You have months where you can make a lot of money and months for you um, where you're dry. Um, yeah. So for us, yes, we're fortunate to be in a position where our real estate investments, rental property portfolio pays our bills, covers our lifestyle. So yes, the money that is earned from the real estate agency business um, is just extra, which really allows me to approach it from a much healthier, more positive perspective, um, leave money on the table sometimes uh, with clients. I, I never feel pushed to push through to the sale uh, when I know it's not the right thing for the client because food's going to be on my table when I get home. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So there's people listening and maybe they watched some other interviews too, and they heard like real estate's an avenue did you grow up and have your parents tell you, you know, hey, make sure you invest in property, you know, cash flows king? Like, was that something that you you grew up with, or is that something that you just learned? And if you learned it along the way, like, who inspired you and who helped accelerate and pour the fire on that for you? That's a great question. Um, so my wife grew up poor, um, probably below the poverty line. Um, I grew up um, primarily in a single mother household. Um, She remarried, great man. Um, She was a breadwinner for my whole life Um, and not affluent by any means. Um, Struggled with debt most of her life. Both my parents struggled with debt most of their lives. And I watched that. I watched my mom uh, do Dave Ramsey, dig herself out of credit card debt twice. Um, and so that was my exposure to financial education started with my mom and Dave Ramsey. She had, I like when I was maybe seven or eight years old, I had the envelopes, Dave Ramsey envelope system. And I, you know, I had so much money for saving, so much money for um, 
giving and so much money to spend. Um, but other than that, no, I did not have any influences in my life early on who were growth minded, understood anything about, let's say, real estate as an asset class. Um, for me, that all started to happen sort of by accident um, after we bought that first property. We bought that first property and then I was trying to learn how to be a landlord. And I think that's when I've probably found bigger pockets. Ah. Read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, went down um, the, <clears throat> the rabbit hole of, um, hey, how do we create a life a, a financial independence? How do I earn passive income through real estate? Um, so I would say bigger pockets, books. Um, I, I had a few mentors, a, a few, a few people um, helped me in that direction, but I definitely would say I was my own pioneer within my circle of influence um, headed down that path. And I mean, I dealt with all the objections, people within my own family telling me the classic, you know, you know, uncle Frank lost his shirt, you know, doing real estate in the seventies and um, you know, all of these objections. Cause uh, for a lot of people, it represented risk. Yeah, no, that's great. How did you find a mentor? Yeah, um, so I don't have an official mentor. I, I've got nobody who would call me their mentee, but I've had people pour into me uh, for sure. Um, Ryan Murdoch, uh, who works for Open Door Capital, and um, he's actually from Maine too. Oh, nice. Uh, so he's from Bangor, Maine. And when I first got on Bigger Pockets, the website there, I just started reaching out to people, letting people know what I was doing in the area. And he was the first person to reach back out to me uh, and uh, invite me to have uh, have dinner. I met him for dinner and um, shared his story with me. You know, a little bit of encouragement. And I never said like, "Hey, Ryan, will you be my mentor?" You know. Um, but from time to time over the years, I'd run into a situation here or there was something that was a little tricky, maybe a market I wasn't so familiar with. And I'd ask a question or two and he, he'd be happy to provide value there. Um, so, and a few other people that um, I would even call them like sim symbiotic mentorship type relationships where I've taught them a few things about what I know. They've taught me a few things about what they know. So I just, I try to look um, to add value to to anyone I come into contact with, regardless of whether I'm on level two and they're on level 10, um, even a guy on level 10, you know, might need some help shoveling his driveway <laughs> or um, working out in the morning, that type of thing. And then I've, I've never been afraid to ask questions. Mm. So I've definitely been an action first, uh, figure it out later type of person, I, I would say. Nice. How, would you say that it's worked out for you more times better than not? I would say so. Um, because of, I would just, I guess I would caution anyone. If you plan to be a dynamic individual and be aggressive in creating your ideal lifestyle, it's probably wise to be very conservative with your personal finances. Um, so that you can afford to fail. The only reason I was able to leave my job and pursue a passion is because we had conservative personal finances and we could afford for me not to make money for a year. We had a financial runway, if you will. Had we not been in that position, let's say we had bought a car, right? I mean, a great W-2 government job. We could have gone out and got qualified for you know, brand new truck, brand new car. Um, bigger house. Well, have we been in that position? A few key decisions, just, just a couple of decisions. Yep. And uh, I could have trapped myself for a decade. Because um, what you do when you take on personal debt for things like that, that are liabilities, not assets, is you spend tomorrow's money today. Yeah. And if you've already spent tomorrow's money, guess who's going to work tomorrow to earn it? <laughs> this guy. Um, so for us, I, I just always, even today, even today, 
I mean, we make, you know, multiple hundred thousand dollar moves at a time with our business. Uh, but on the personal side of our finances, we're still keeping track of our grocery budget. We're still counting our gas money and just um, making sure that we've got a really solid, safe, stable financial foundation underneath us so that we can swing for the fences um, in our business and investments. Oh, that's so good. That's such good info for people because you're right, they do spend tomorrow's money. And I know because I was in $30,000, $40,000 credit card debt for three times, right? So I always like to say I'm an overachiever. I don't do things once or twice. I got to do it three times. <laughs> so um, I, I lived that firsthand, but I learned from it. And I learned from great mentors, from people, people pouring into me like they poured into you. And so that's where your social circle becomes so powerful and who you surround yourself with. Um, like a Ryan Murdoch, right? And so, and then obviously we connected through Go Abundance. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, for those people that don't know what Go Abundance is, why don't you share with them what Go Abundance is about? How do you, uh, you know, how can you be in a, an exclusive mastermind like that? And, you know, and even also, what do you take away from Go Abundance? Yeah, that's a, that's a, another great question. Go Abundance. Um, I think is just a wonderful example of the power of a mastermind. Um, it's not the only mastermind group out there, but it, it's certainly one full of really action-packed, high-quality individuals. Um, so GoBundance uh, originally started as the tribe of millionaire men. Um, it was just a, 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 men, a group of men um, devoted to... Um, further bettering themselves, really, um, strengthening their financial positioning, increasing their health, having better marriages and relationships, um, genuine contribution um, to society, um, and, and a few other things, just really committed to living a holistic lifestyle. Being a whole life millionaire is, is one of the phrases we use frequently. Um, so for me, I became aware of GoBundance um, before I was a millionaire uh, through the through the Bigger Pockets podcast, I think, and a little bit of Brandon's testimony. Um, and I always just had it in my head, like, "Hey, the day I hit that million dollar mark, um, I'm I'm going to join GoBundance." Um, I believe that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And I want to surround myself with incredible people, not just not just wealthy people or financially successful people, but people that are devoted to growth, people that are devoted to personal development, people that are devoted to strong relationships. Um, and I've had a great time since joining GoBundance. I'm building uh, great, authentic relationships, yep. um, overcoming imposter syndrome finding ways to add value to people um, that I, I feel like I don't even deserve to be in the same room as. Um, but it's, it's incredible sometimes. Uh, we put people on pedestals, but at the end of the day, um, everybody, me, President of the United States, Grant Cardone, we all wake up and put our pants on the same way. Uh, we all have shared common ground. We all have parents that pass away. Um, we all have uh, children who act up in public um, and embarrass us. Amen. <laughs> so yeah, just finding, finding ways to authentically connect and add value to truly extraordinary individuals. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's such an, it, the reason why we're even here on this interview today is because of Go Abundance. Um, and I remember when I moved out from San Diego to Idaho, I was looking for that like hustle and grind, like get after because I could go to a mastermind any night of the week with six, seven figure monthly earners, right? <clears throat> and then we come out here to start a family and everyone like is about family and nature and connecting and getting out and friendly. And, and I love that. And that's why we moved here. But then I was like, well, where's the go-getters? And mm -hmm. I couldn't find any. 
And I almost paid $30,000 to join the highest end country club because I was like, at least I can network with high individuals there. And um, so running some masterminds with my buddy, Jason Drees, one of the things that I did was I kept hearing about GoBundance, GoBundance. He told me he joined and I was like, all right, <clears throat> let me look into this. And so when I did, all of a sudden, is like, I got put in the group. This guy said, you got to meet this person. I met this person in Boise. I got introduced to AJ Osborne and, you know, and all the things he's doing. And he lives down the street from me. And now we're creating a partnership together. And it's just like, none of this would have happened. And I honestly thought there was no hustlers out here, but through GoBundance has actually shown me that there's, there are people out here and, but they are, I don't want to say exclusive, but they're kind of like, you know, hidden. So you got to find them. If yeah. anybody wants, like, if you're, if you're inspired by any portion of my story, um, and you want to hear another story about someone who uh, used financial independence to help them through a really, really hard time, AJ Osborne has a story. He's, his book, um, was, was it, uh, passive income through self-storage, maybe. Uh, but he's got a great book and a great story um, just about, um, again, a, a medical nightmare um, and, and, and how financial independence was really able to help him live his values through that time. Yeah, it's a, it's a story. Even on his Instagram, uh, he shows the videos of it and it's, it's heart-wrenching. I I, I sent him a message afterwards after I saw that and just really impressed. So, but that, that comes, so let's bring this all full circle for everyone that comes from really getting clear on what do you want in your life? Like, what do you want it to look like? Because maybe you don't want financial independence and that's okay. All right. Maybe you love what you do and you love to have experiences and you live in the now. And if that's the, you know, if that's you mastering life, yeah. your mind, then awesome. But for those of you that are like, I want this lifestyle. I want to be like Riley. Like if anything ever happened to anyone in my family, my business, my, whether you choose business or real estate or whatnot, you have those vehicles as assets that bring money in while you sleep. And I heard you can't be financially free unless you can make money while you're sleeping. Mm. And, you know, let me, um, I, I've talked a lot about kind of the tragedies in our life, um, but, but we're living too. I mean, I believe that you can have both and um, I believe that you can be financially frugal and live below your means and build massive wealth and have bucket list adventures all at the same time. So when my wife, she did all her radiate, all her chemotherapy all her radiation, had a double mastectomy. When my baby was eight months old in August, August 8th or 9th, my wife finished her last radiation treatment. August 12th, 2021, we hopped in the car and went on a 67 day cross country road trip, visited a bunch of national parks, tented for 33 days with our newborn baby. Um, you know, it, it can be done. You can have both. And, and one of the things I tell my, the people that I coach a lot um, is that you have to give yourself permission to define success for yourself. Mm. You shouldn't waste a moment trying to live somebody else's dream or trying to live somebody else's values. Cause you're all, you really are, you're going to accomplish somebody else's pinnacle achievement and find it underwhelming. So mm -hmm. you've got to take the time to ask yourself what you authentically and truly value and chase after that um, and, and be okay with the fact that other people are gonna find great fulfillment, success and happiness in different ways than you do um, and just live your best life um, for you and, and those that you love. Yeah. So that's my two cents on that. So good. So good. Well, 
I'm excited uh, because not only have you go, you went from like this challenging situation, but to this life where you get to live life on your terms, right? And have the experiences and take a 67 day road trip, uh, you know, and seeing the world and doing fun things like that. Um, because that's the point, right? Like we're not, you don't sacrifice, you don't take on, you know, there's always going to be risk and everything, but you, you mitigate it, but you, you take certain risks so that you can have the life that you want. Right. And so many times I find that fear holds people back from actually taking that leap. And so, um, and that's why I believe, and I'm speaking biasly as a professional coach too, and, and investor, but like as a professional coach, it's like, that's why you need to have a coach is to help some, uh, have someone help you work through that stuff. So those limitations are that we think are walls are actually just speed bumps, right? It's like, so it's a sound for a moment. And we're like, oh yeah, that's not true. And we keep going, right? That's what we want to do. So, all right, before we wrap up, I got, uh, I just want to ask a couple um, questions here. Yeah, um, for sure. First, What's one book that's impacted your life the most and why? Mm, this is a great question. Um, I, I'm going to throw a toss up first. and I'm going to say the Bible, right? Because it's the, the foundation from which I am building everything and living by. Um, Scott Trench, Set for Life, um, has really impacted me. It's the book mm -hmm. I give away the most frequently. Um, it's just a great book. Talks about house hacking, talks about uh, renting versus house hacking versus home ownership and the trajectory that that can set you on um, in your financial life. And I really believe that, especially, especially, especially for young people, you can make a few great decisions between the ages of let's say 18 and 25 or you can make a few bad decisions and, and, and those decisions can drastically impact the next 40 years. Yeah. Ah, so good. Well, I, that's a book I haven't listened to, but I will have to set my uh, Amazon yeah. over on that bad boy. It's a, it's a simple, easy read. It's not too technical, um, good. but it's really easy to understand. So it's not like the millionaire next door. No, that is a very technical book <laughs> that I've also right. read and also love, um, but I don't give it away as much. You really got to have the, the heart to read that one. Yeah. If, if, yeah. There's a lot of data in there. Yeah. A lot of data. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Love. Yes. Yes. I, I love that. In doses, in doses, pro formas, stuff like that. Um, so obviously you have the life that you guys are creating obviously there's more but if people want to be able to connect with you reach out learn from you whatever it might be how can they get in touch with you or follow yeah, this you? is a this is a great question that i'm almost ashamed to answer so i'm pretty much uh, digitally non-existent um but i am on facebook so riley knox on facebook um or you can send me an email riley Dox, riley dot knox nine six at gmail. So it's R Y L E E dot K N O X nine six at Gmail. And I do respond to all of my emails. So if you want to connect, I'm happy to add value in any way that I can. Also, and awesome. And if you're in his area and you want to buy a house or sell your house, reach out to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story, the insight, the wisdom for people. You know, everyone gets something different from every video. So I really appreciate you taking time from your family and your financial freedom to be able to come out and to deliver and serve other people. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. All right, time. guys. Well, that's a wrap for this show. Tune in for the next one and we will be uh, we will be coming at you with more content, more videos, more interviews as we move forward. But once again, Riley, thank you so much. All right, everyone. Have a great day. See ya.